Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. And here we're going to be talking about Spying 217, Tokyo Story, directed by Yasujiro Ozu, 1953. Man, this film is 60 years old, good grief. Okay, um, this is also going to be kind of a big one because I'm going to be talking about uh, a film that has a lot in it, and I'm going to be talking about a director that a lot has been said about him. Um, so where to start with this? <laughs> I, have a, I have a couple different ways of how to start this. I guess I'll, I guess I'll talk about, first I'll talk about um, the story itself, uh, since that's relatively easier. Um, Tokyo's story is about a old couple who decide to go down to Tokyo to see their children and also their grandchildren. And and that's actually that's kinda of, and then they go back and, and actually and when they when they go back um the 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 woman is is uh struck with an illness illness. Actually it's a stroke that she has and then she she actually ends up dying and so the children have to go up to where they are to uh, to say their farewells and to mourn and so on and that's really I mean that's the that's the story distilled to its really really basic uh, <laughs> basic form but what makes it interesting is in its details um, one of the um, the children that they visit are they're actually uh, they actually have four in, in their family history. They have four children, and uh, one of them is a one of them is a doctor, uh, a pediatrician actually, and not not the best doctor, um, or not not because he's not good, but his business is not doesn't put him in, in a really good position. Like he has to be in the house all the time, which means that. Any time that the family wants to go out and do something, um, he's he always has to be on call. Um, they also have a daughter who uh, runs a beauty parlor and comes off as very very stingy and uh, kind of you know not not entirely likable <laughs> at all. Um, they had a son who was uh, presumed dead during the war and is survived by his widow. And um, their daughter-in-law ends up being the most loving and considerate and genuinely loving out of all of them, um, which it kind of makes me think of... Uh, it makes me think of Ruth in, in, this, in this regard, just someone who's, who's outside of the, of the circle who ends up being the most loyal and supportive and, and loving to the circle than those within the circle. And then there's a fourth that shows up much later who's kind of the, kind of, who's on the young side. Oh, I'm sorry, they have, they have five children. Yeah, because um, their, their youngest daughter actually lives nearby, actually lives in the same town they live in, and she's a school teacher. That's it, yeah. It's, <laughs> I told you there's a lot in, <laughs> there's a lot that goes on. Um, and this is actually part of the charm. And actually, Tokyo Story is uh, the best way to get into Ozu. And I'm not just saying that because that's actually how I got into it. But I, I would really recommend this. Like, if you want to know who Yasujiro Ozu is and what he's all about, it's a really good film to watch in that regard. Um, you get a lot out of him in that. So, okay, so who, so who is Yasujiro Ozu? Well... What I'm about to say is a very is a gross simplification, but I think it's but I, I think it's a simplification that that works, and that is uh, you can divide Western fans of Japanese cinema into basically two camps: those who hold Akira Kurosawa in high regard and those who hold Yasujiro Ozu in high regard. Now, if you know anything about Japanese cinema, there is there are Plenty of other directors besides just Kurosawa and Ozu. You got Kenji Mizuguchi. You got um, Hiroshi Tashigahara. You got uh, Kendo uh, Shindo. You got 
uh, Kan Ichikawa, um, you got uh, Nagashi Oshima, who actually died a couple of months ago. Uh, or, uh, no, he died this year, I think. Um, so there's pl uh, Shinji Suzuki, plenty of Japanese directors, um, but usually those two are considered the, the top uh, in Western eyes, certainly, in ja for Japanese cinema. Um, the directors that claim Kurosawa is a big influence include um, Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, among many others, uh, the Rakowskis also. And then for Ozu, you get uh, Vin Vendors and Jim Jarmusch. And sad to say, those are the... And I guess Paul Schrader would be another another one. Um, so, and I wish I remembered more, but... Uh, but So there you go. So, in a, in a sense, Kurosawa is... To continue on the simplification, Kurosawa is, if you like more of your mainstream type films and Ozu is is the is the guy you go to if you want something a little bit different a little uh, an alternative if you like and what makes Ozu particularly an alternative well first off as I try to sum up with the story it's the the impression is that there is not much of a plot and there really isn't and the interesting thing is that Tokyo Story is one of the few of his films, and he made, I forget how many films he ended up making, but he was, he was, quite, he was quite productive um, in, in his career. Um, this is one of the few films where there is a melodramatic plot in it, uh, but everything else is more or less plotless, and it's, it's less about, actually I should say, it's less about the plot and more about the characters, and even in a bigger sense, it's more about um, the stuff of life. Um, people about to, you know, people being born, people about to be married, people dying, just all these little facets of of life, and what can go on um, in that in that moment. What what happens when? When a change occurs within a family, and that's that's some and that's a, those are the things that Ozu explored in, pretty much all his films is is those moments in the life of a, of a family, and that's what he was interested in. And Tokyo Story is a really good example of this. Um, and also, like I said, this is one of the few times where you get something resembling a melodrama, and in fact, this was considered, I don't know if it was ever explicitly stated, I, I think it was, but this could be considered a remake of Leo McLaren's Make Way for Tomorrow, made in 1939, I believe. That's also on the Criterion Collection, too. Uh, I don't have it, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and actually, I said I was going to talk about this earlier, but this is actually an example of a good remake. Um, let's assume that it is a through-and-through through remake of, of Make Way for Tomorrow. Because of Ozu's style, and, and particularly the, the way, what he wanted to show in his films, and the way he shot them, and the way things play out, it does add something to the story. Whereas... I, again, I haven't seen Make Way for Tomorrow, so, but I can assume that it is it was designed as a straightforward melodrama. And with... I, and, I'm, and I'm sure that there's, there was a little bit more to it, but it, it plays in that, in that way. But this is an example of a film that uses that, that storyline but, but adds something to it. And, and the fact that this is made this this was made in Japan um, by Japanese pretty much for Japanese Ozu got got the uh, got a somewhat unfair label that he is the most Japanese of of Japanese uh, directors which I think that's not entirely true uh, considering that he gets a lot of attention from outside of Japan I mentioned again Vim Vendors and Jim Jarmusch really admired Ozu. And in fact, Tokyo's story, last, last year in um, the Sight and Sound poll, 
Whereas Vertigo was number one for the critics, Tokyo Story was number one for the directors. And so it's, it's definitely, and, and actually Tokyo Story is his best well-known film. Um, and was, was the film that got Ozu a lot of international attention. So um, not bad for someone who's supposedly the most Japanese. And I think partly why he gets that stigma is that a lot of what he does is very rooted in Japanese culture. And he was very much interested in the contemporary. He was not, he was not interested in period pieces. He was not interested in um, any kind of escapist fantasy. He was really, really interested in the here and now. What is happening, and particularly what's happening to families right here and, and now. And in that sense, Tokyo Story is a kind of time capsule of what was going on in Japan. The year this came out and that was 1953. So this is, this is the time, this is certainly after World War II. Uh, and this was also at around the time when Japan was, was uh, beginning to really boom. I, I think they're on the verge of an economic boom um, after the American occupation of Japan. And so in, in one sense, they've, you know, the, the war is still there, but they've, they've also more or less recovered from it. And, and they're, they're starting to move on and also become a, an industrious, na an industrial nation. Um, so there's, there's that kind of change. And, and Ozu was interested in, in exploring that. And also, I think, but paradoxically, while he was interested in, in the here and now, there was also the sense that he was looking at themes that have, that have always been, that are worth considering in, in creating a work. Um, I mean, there, there are plenty of other things, but particularly the, the just the notions of, of family and cycle of life and, and transitions in, in life, changes in life. So on the one hand, he was, he was inter very interested in the contemporary, but he was also interested in something of the eternal because Ozu was not, while well, he's also not a period <laughs> uh, filmmaker, he also wasn't a overt political filmmaker. He wasn't... He wasn't there with manifestos and so forth. He was, he actually, he himself considered, he thought of himself as a, uh, more of a craftsman. Um, and he, the way that he approached making films was more like making tofu. And it's, it's, I you think, uh, that's, that's a bad comparison. But what he's, what he's saying is that he wants to make um, an enjoyable, film really well. Uh, he's not he's not there to make some kind of grand artistic statement or he's or to stand out from the crowd. He just really wants to make something that anybody can enjoy and that it's done well and with with a certain craft and care. And interestingly enough, because this actually makes him stand this paradoxically makes him stand out and um, for for someone that um, wanted to make films that were still very enjoyable, uh, you notice the kind of crowd that he attracts are the ones that like doing unusual and interesting things with films anyway. Um, and by the way, you want to ask, you may ask, where do I fit in all this? <laughs> Am I more Kurosawa or Ozu? I would probably say that while I definitely like a lot of stuff with Kurosawa, and I can, I can see why Kurosawa's appeal, I probably feel more closer to Ozu in, in a lot of respects. Um, because of what his interests are, were and, and also kind of how he did it. The other thing that's often talked about with Ozu is the way he made his films. Uh, he was, and there are some things that are very, that, have, that are characteristic to Ozu. Uh, one of which is, um, is his, is the way that, uh, is the way that he composed his shots. And mo most of his shots were, done what's come to be called the uh, tatami style where the idea is is that it's supposed to be shot in a way as if you were if you as if you yourself were sitting on a tatami mat looking at a room and interestingly enough it's actually much lower than how you actually 
how you actually see it. Now, of course, it's going to slightly vary depending on how tall you are, but um, but even so, the uh, the tatami shot is actually about a foot lower, a foot or two lower than an average what an average person would see at that level if he was actually if you're actually sitting on a tatami mat. And he would he would often do the shot. A lot of his a lot of his scenes take place in interiors. There's 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 not a lot of there's very very few exterior shots. Or I should say that there are very few exterior scenes. There's definitely some establishing shots that that occur outside, but most of his action takes place in interiors. And so this is where the shot really comes in. And and the idea is that again this is this is supposed to be like you looking at the room and seeing everything the scene unfolds. So it's um takes on a slightly more it's it's more subject uh, more objective I should say. The other characteristic of Ozu is the way he shoots his conversations. Um Whereas most conversations are are shot using, well, all of them use shot reverse shot, but uh, for most conversations you see are over the shoulder, where it's basically like, say I'm here, then another person is there, and when you see me talking, you see my face and then the other guy kind of over, and then when you when it turns to his shot. Um, I want to make sure I got <laughs> I got this right because the idea is is that um, for for the sake of continuity, Aaron, you there's this line between uh, the two people, and you're not supposed to cross this line. So if the camera is here looking at the other guy, it's not going to you, you can't you can't do it from the other side. So that means when you do the reverse shot, it has to be from from him. So from him. So. And what you're looking at right now is what he would see, and then the reverse would be what, what I would see. Um, so that's what you typically see in conversations. What Ozu did was very, very subtle, but also very, um, was very subtle, but very memorable. And that is he goes completely 180. And what I mean by that is that if two people are talking, you see the one person, you see him... You, you see the person straight on. He's look, uh, um, the one the one person is looking directly into the camera, and then when it cuts to the other person, it's the same position. So all so the so the difference really is between the two two people. There's not that much difference uh, between the positions and so forth. There there's a sense of of based on the position and also the duration of the shot is the complete line. There's no um, there, there's no cut. There's no um, voiceover when when it cuts. Uh, basically, what you see in the shot is it will equal the line that's delivered. There's no there's no crossovers in in that in that sense. So yeah, uh, <laughs> and so and that's and that's a very that's a very Ozu approach. In fact, I would say that if you've actually the re a really good example of this is in the silence of the lamps of, of this playing out. If you, if you if you notice how the way that those conversations were done, that's that's how Ozu did it. And I would not be surprised if um, uh, Fuji Takimogo, who uh, shot Silence of the Lambs, was was influenced by that. Um, there's other there's other little Ozu moments that I could see in his work. He also worked with John Hughes on. Um, I believe on the Breakfast Club, and I know he did it for Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The other, the other thing that Ozu liked to do was to <clears throat> have his establishing shots. Um, just well, it does two. I mean, the first thing it does is that it establishes where you are in the story, but he also would show. He would also frame it in such a way as to emphasize uh, lines, I believe, um, and to. So that it's it's not just it's not just oh this is an establishing shot there's there's a sense of geometry um, at at work in, in there as well. Um, he's also the other thing that characterizes Ozu is that in his as I said before his his films are less about the plot and more about the characters and their situations. Um, in his narratives, 
he makes use of a lot of ellipses. And where at, and by that is that there's a lot of scenes that are not shown, but they're often alluded to after the fact. You don't and in fact there's there's a lot of moments that can be considered very crucial moments that you would you would need to see in order to, in order for the narrative to work. But the reason why you don't but the reason why it works even though you don't see them is that well one it's it is reference and two it's a way of engaging the audience and 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 getting them involved in the story and, and to kind of fill in those gaps and and say okay this is how you do so this is not the same thing as plot holes. There's, it's not. This is a, a deliberate absence of material um, that will be filled in indirectly in other ways. Uh, very often through through the use of dialogue of oh we remember when we did this even though it was never even shown. So that's another characteristic of of Ozu is his use of ellipses. Um, now I guess I'll, I'll guess I'll conclude with that. It's become, I've developed a cinematic tradition, a personal cinematic tradition, where I watch this film every New Year's. And I either, I either try to do it, I, I try to do it on New Year's Day if I can. But if I know that I, I can't do it for whatever reason, I, I would do it on New Year's Eve. And I actually, I got the idea from listening to the commentary track uh, given by David, David Desser, uh, who pointed out that in Tokyo Story, there's a lot of talk about, there's, there's a lot of moments that point to the greater cycle of life, of, you know, people, you know, people are born, people die, people get married, um, and, you know, people start a family, and there's all these little things that make up life, and it's a really good single illustration of that, and what better way to remind yourself of this then on New Year's. So, so I, I do make it a point to watch it um, every, every New Year's. I did not, I did not review it for, for this review. So this is why I'm, I'm kind of going more on, on my memory of, of, of how I saw it. But, um, so again, actually, so recommendation. I, yes, I, of course I highly recommend it. Um, Especially since it's on, it's on the it's one of those films that show up in the sight and sound polls. Um, it's definitely a a great introduction to Ozu. If you want to know what he's all about, um, it, it really it's it's probably the most accessible. It's not to say that Ozu's films aren't really accessible, but I will say that there it can be something you have to get used to. Especially the especially the narrative ellipses. You you may have to you have to, may have to adjust to, and also the, the the pacing of it is is more natural. It's there's nothing terribly quick about it. Uh, the, it 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 moves, but it doesn't. It's it's not frantic. Uh, it, there's um, it's it's a bit more leisurely the way the way things unfold, um, and the. Situations are not what you typically. Again, this 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 isn't period. This isn't a period piece. This isn't um, you know something really fantastical. This is something actually quite very ordinary. But it doesn't it doesn't feel bland. And I think that's that's the the great thing about Ozu is is that while he's doing while he's dealing with universal things, it doesn't doesn't feel banal or bland or or just like ah eh, same old same old. There there is that there's something more to it and there is a uh, there is a, a charm and a power uh, to his film so I definitely recommend it on uh, at the very least checking it out and and to give it a spin um, and in fact <laughs> this is this is shameless advertising time I've heard that uh, for this weekend and by this weekend I mean so February 16th 17th 2013 um, all of their, um, you can w you can watch all the Criterion titles that are available, meaning that they're not considered out of print. That the the Criterion titles that are available through Hulu, um, you can do that anyway. But normally you have to you have to subscribe to Hulu Plus. It's seventeen ninety nine a month. 
but here they're they're making a special offer uh, so that you can see all their titles for free this weekend. So uh, it's a great way to catch up on a lot of Criterion. And uh, if you find that a weekend is not enough, get the Hulu Plus and you'll be able to... Uh, the great thing is that you're, you're able to watch all the available Criterions right then and there, and you can pretty much watch it anywhere. So you can watch it on your... You can watch it on your smartphone, you can watch it on your computer. Uh, it's just, and, and that is... And this is actually the reason why you can get Criterion titles on Netflix, but not uh, Netflix streaming. You have to actually get the physical seat, uh, physical DVD and, and uh, Blu-ray disc in order to see it. So, but uh, you can see it streaming through Hulu, and you can see it for free this weekend. So, I would say check it out. So yeah, and yeah, this is probably one I, I could have gotten on a little bit more, but really, I think it's it's something where you really have to see it for yourself, and and I. And if you give it a chance, and it will be quite rewarding. So there you go. Tokyo Story. And until next time, take care.